very well, Rich, thank you. Good, good, good. You're a GP who's looked after lots of sick doctors. What do you think is going on out there? Oh, it's a very good question. I, I think, as you said, the NHS has been chronically abused, but I think the overwhelming emotions of the doctors that I see is, is twofold. One is, it was one part, it's fear. Fear of annihilation, either losing your job, losing your service, uh, losing your livelihood. And the second one is fear of exposure. And I think we've hardwired into the NHS about the culture of blame, shame, uh, and in particular, <coughs> hardwired into it through some of our systems like NHS Choices, the Friends and Family Club, <coughs> but everything else. And, and Jeremy Hunt also now wants to expose GPs who miss cancer and he's going to go out and stop in the middle of Cavendish Square and have <coughs> rotten tomatoes thrown at us. That is the next step. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gerhard, you've worked with senior managers of some very sick organisations. What, what do you think is going on here in the NHS? How do you well, see I it? think I want to follow that on because in my last book I wrote that the NHS is a traumatised organisation. And that, so, going on from your emotional abuse repeatedly, I mean, normally we think of trauma in terms of war or natural disasters or sexual abuse, but I try, I'm arguing there that repeated experiences of being asked to do things that you actually don't have the resources or the power to deliver, and having no control over really negotiating the task, if you like, and being persecuted if you don't meet it or publicly shamed, is a form of slow torture, traumatization, if you like. Yeah. Is it on? No. no. Is this on? Yes. So, what are the consequences of an organization being traumatized? Uh, one of the things that happens is it looks for transformational or magical leadership solutions. And as a German, first of all German, the one advantage in that birth is that you've been inoculated against leadership <laughs> for the, probably two centuries. So when I hear the call for leadership as the solution to every problem, I think it's a symptom rather than a solution. And I think it's much worse now, because if I look at, I mean, we can talk about the historical trends, but I think right now, and the thing I see in the NHS is really the cons I mean, I think the Lansley reform, if you like, was the sort of uh, finally coming together of all the madness dressed up as idealism and technocratic perfection. Lansley would have made a really good Nazi, actually, organizing the Holocaust. Because that's what people have to understand, that's what they were like. Thank God we're not in that kind of context yet. But there are lots of the elements that led to that kind of context that are present. So at the moment, I think I just see a lot of turf wars going on because the NHS was thrown up in the air and they began to organize it where it landed. Sort of. And then afterwards, all hell broke out in terms of no decision making, scrambling <coughs> for resources, scramble for for positions. I think there's a quite powerful myth now gripping people because they've seen all these managers first of all suck the bronze, silver, golden handshake, then recycled and re-employed. So I think a lot of people in the edge believe that the resource issue is actually connected with that, really, that they are getting accused of being inefficient and actually it's the leadership, the politicians, and the managers who made it inefficient and wasted it. Which I think is one of the terrible splits to manage. The clinicians get blamed when things go wrong. And the managers, who are so normally on front stage, disappear behind stage. And I think that's a terrible so a cultural atmosphere that that's produced on us. Claire, can I ask you to bring it back to the front line, as it were? What, what are actually people experiencing well, there, and what are we going to do about it in this project? And again, to follow on from Gerhardt, and 
we haven't found this, but I think at the level of the individual, what we experience is, with respect to, for example, splitting, is the rise of bullying, is the rise of whistleblowing, is the rise of being referred uh, for minor transgressions to a regulator or to, to any disciplinary body. Because what we're actually seeing is, is, is warfare going on within the NHS. And what we're actually seeing is people who really, in a past world, and not to idealise the past world, but would be starting to sort things out through communication, through uh, relationships, are now sorting things out through the courts or through the regulators. So that's what I see. And though I'm only seeing a, a certain end, I mean, we've had 1,500 doctors coming with mental health problems, and we're now going from a, a rate of three per week to 15 per week. We're seeing so many that we've actually had to put on our website that we're going to have to temporarily sort of dampen down the, the number that we see. And it is this constant anxiety that, that people are, are, are fearing and this constant sense of change going on in their organisations and, and change leads to loss of relationships. I mean, I mean, I'm... Okay, does that work? In, in the good old days, <laughs> when even the future was better, um, there was a pattern in organizations, uh, in, organiza in business schools, it's called uh, un uh, freeze, unfreeze, refreeze. That was the model for change in the old days. So you had, some, you had a stable pattern, then you deliberately disturbed it to adjust some for your organization to a changed reality or to some changed plan, and then you refroze it. So people had a space in which to recover, mourn, let go, reattach, and not to be confused. All the kind of things we experience when we've lost the loved person or something like that. And now, I think it's just permanent transition. There is no recovery period. And that is why we're sitting here. It's the, and that's, you know, that's where I think that the hope starts. People actually taking their own time to gather to make a recovery space, space in which to step back and think and reflect what is happening to all of us, what's happening to me, where can we start picking up? Just, just, to, go, yeah, just, just to go a little bit further on this, what have we lost in the NHS thing? Because if that's made me think, I remember my first experience as a houseman in a very busy job in a teaching hospital. It did feel like the NHS sort of looked after you, made you feel safe somehow. I remember one silly example was at midnight in the canteen every night they'd give you beans on toast for free, as it were. And it felt like the organisation was in some way, I don't know, mothering you, I suppose, as you use it were. But it did feel like it was a safe place to be where they were looking after you. And I can't imagine anything like that happening nowadays. Something well, well I, had, I had a conversation with some lovely nurses the other day about the tea and toast, and they looked at me and said, they're not allowed to make toast anymore on the ward because of health and safety. And, uh, I was a bit shocked. I think we have lost, and again with the doctors I see, and I know with, with nursing staff, the, the extraordinary hours, the fact that we aren't being nurtured, our, our younger doctors in particular, though they have shorter working hours, actually have a much worse working life, moving around every three to four months with some basic human needs not addressed, food uh, on, on their shifts, uh, somewhere to rest on their shifts, even not having somewhere time to live. So I think you're right. But I want to pick up on the hope, and I think the fact that we are here, the fact that we are running these across the country, the fact that increasingly uh, the voices of those from various different organisations are coming together, not just about creating an empathic or compassionate NHS, but actually about trying to get those who have power to hear what's being said by those around us. And there is hope. I mean, we've set up something called the Founders Network, where we're bringing together different organisations. So my sense is we have learned helplessness, and what we need to do is to move out of being the battered puppy or the victim and start to, to act. I mean, uh, uh, when, yeah, to, to pick up on this thing, uh, I talk about normally that the 
NHS used to be the good enough mother of the nation, where they had the delegated task of looking after the staff, the patients, but maybe also, I, I, I'm interested in long-term psychological processes in societies. I think the NHS was the location point in the historical, cultural matrix of Britain for the good community in the war. When you had a clear uh, enemy, you had a just fight, you could feel morally good about yourselves, and there was a sense of community. And the NHS had that for a very long time, until the Vandals came. The Vandals are the neoliberal economists who Actually, it's misnamed, they are not liberal, they are neoconservative, bordering on fascistic elements. Let's name it. So what we have now is a failing mother that neither looks after their staff or the patients appropriately, and we have a father, daddy state, who is looking for a divorce or reduce alimony pays. That's really where we are. <laughs> there's probably enormous uh, legal costs, which actually continue the analogy, because the, the, the costs of uh, running the NHS has gone from about 2 to 3 percent of, of the, the cost of the NHS to around about 15 percent. And so that's a, a, a useful analogy. And uh, I suppose if it does divorce, maybe the, 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 uh, what, the, the step parents might be better off uh, than the original parents. I mean, to, to continue, I work a lot. In Scandinavia, and what's in Germany and Switzerland, a meeting like this without food, unthinkable. So actually, what you, the loss you complain about? No, this I want to make this point because the, 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 the leading idea that dominates in age and the whole society gets into every crevice of every. It's not out there, over there. It's in here too. Yes. In Denmark, this meeting would have started by gathering out there, building the community with food and drink. Now, to carry that on, it's a society which is comfortable with 50% plus taxation, basic taxation. So you have a different dialogue about the role of the health system. So I, I followed this in Denmark. They talked about old people's elements. They discussed openly different models. And the most sensible solution was even, even a little bit more taxation, but it's free, completely free. If you walk into a Danish old people's home, you see very different stuff from what you see here. Uh, actually, here it looks better than Germany, so it's it's not a simple sort of. So you have in Germany you have a rich society, and okay, thanks very much. I just want to ask one thing of both of you before we move back and continue the conversation with everybody. And that's really, what are you sort of expecting to hear from people today? What do you think it would be helpful to, um, to help with our sort of assessment of what's going on in the NHS? Just to give people a, a sort of idea of um, where we're going with it all, perhaps. I would hope that people would be honest uh, and tell us, because actually, I don't know if you saw the word art that's out there. I think when we put all this together, we will do a word art, and I think actually it's important but whatever the words and the feelings and the dominant uh, emotions come through. So there are, I don't have expectations other than the fact that I just want to listen so that it will help me in my dialogue going further. Well, I expect uh, the normal thing uh, which mirrors a therapy group in a non-therapy group in society, which is that phase one has to be uh, letting naming the pain, talking about your suffering, moaning perhaps, and maybe taking up a victim position. And I would hope that by the afternoon you get forward a bit. And I have some quite, I mean, just to provoke you a bit, I think. Uh, and I think it's group analysts, and I wrote it in my GP book, and it was the most controversial thing about it when it came out that I advocated self-care comes before patient care, which was news to doctors and they were shocked and they thought it was morally wrong. Okay. That's one thing. That's what I think this is what this gathering hopefully can produce. How much self-care do I have to invest before I can even begin?
seem to be of any use to a patient. But organizations have another tendency which doesn't get talked about honestly. And in psychiatry, perhaps it's most visible. That they have a tendency to simply look after the staff and then ask for more support for the staff and widen the gap between looking after the staff and neglecting the patients. Really. And in psychiatry, I think that stage has been re reached, in my view, provocatively. Two more, several more things. I think if you want to help yourself and have some hope, you have to talk more honestly about certain cultural patterns in the NHS. The culture of inclusivity and the demand to know everything, which we know from child development is very bad for the child, actually. So you have to... But a lot of time and resources are wasted in meetings with far too many people in it that are far too long and are far too irrelevant to be able to sit in a meeting, but serve some fetishized idea of democracy. More hierarchy in certain areas, less in others. And, yeah, that's enough. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> okay, with that I think we'll move back into the circle and continue the conversation with everybody.